so of course, the first session today, this morning, is an introduction to construction grammar. We're going to place it, compare it to a very traditional approach in linguistics. Um, there is a strong structuralist background, um, if you think about it, but of course it's got um, um, the notion that we are talking about a mental model of grammar, um, so we'll introduce you to the main ideas of the framework. Um, we're going to talk about how this changes the view from a classical kind of lexicon and syntactic rules model, um, which I think most other syntactic theories um, actually employ, to an idea where everything is constructions. That's why we relabel the lexicon as a constructicon. Um, but as we shall argue throughout, that's not just a new name for old stuff, but it's a new perspective on the old stuff. Um, then we're going to move on to usage-based approaches, which take seriously the individual token that people produce, process, and hear. So how does our linguistic performance affect our competence? So again, this moves away from the classical Chomsky distinction um, of competence as knowledge, which is sort of separate from performance. Um, but as we argue, there is extensive research that shows that your performance, again, has an effect on your competence and that these things interact um, and sort of depend on each other. Um, then we're going to talk uh, about how constructions can be learned, um, how people learn them based on input frequency as well as uh, domain general cognitive processes uh, like analogy, schematization, generalization. Um, and that's one of the big things in, in usage-based construction grammar, that you assume that there are independent principles which shape your grammar, but if possible, you would not say that these are just language-specific Okay, not like the language module, uh, but that these depend on general cognitive skills, which we've got anywhere, anyway, because we generalize scenes and situations, um, and we learn these things, and the idea is that the same kind of mental processes that are responsible for that also shape your grammar, which construction grammarians would argue is a simpler model than assuming that language is something completely different and you need extra mechanisms for it. Okay, so... First things first, um, that's from Adele Goldberg's 2003 paper. Um, she says that construction grammar is a new theoretical approach to language that allows linguistic observations about four meaning pairings, known as constructions, to be stated directly. Um, and that already includes the most crucial definition, a construction is always a pairing of form and meaning. And as a, as a lead-in, and of course, what kind of full meaning pairings do we know? Obviously, linguistic signs, words. Those are the classic items that everybody believes you've got to store. Okay? So if you've got a linguistic sign, a word like apple, you know that it's got a string of sounds, apple, and those are associated with a conceptual meaning of an apple. I've put a picture here, but obviously in our minds we haven't got um, a picture. Um, in line with cognitive theories, we would assume that the mental representation is a rich concept that includes things like that you've got a notion of uh, the shape of an apple, how apples taste, what you can do with it, um, that kind of thing, how they smell. Um, so a multimodal representation that is encyclopedic and not just uh, semantic truth conditional. Um, and the relationship, and that's something that Cecile already says, um, is arbitrary and conventional because in English we say apple, the three sounds to um, en encode the meaning. Uh, in German it's apfel, French pom, uh, Hungarian, Hungarian olmo, okay? Different strings of sounds, but a similar concept. We would assume that in Western societies where you're exposed to similar types of apples, um, you would have a similar kind of concept, okay? That's the arbitrary bit. Um, and that construction grammar comes along and says, okay, that's a full meaning pairing, so we're going to call it a construction. That's already the first construction that you see. Um, and at this point, you might go like, well, that's just relabeling. Um, and it, I always feel like uh, I'm part of an ad advertisement company when I do that. And you're like, we're going to call it construction from now on. It's a way better term. But hopefully what we're going to show is that this idea can be extended and it will cover the whole range of linguistic knowledge. Okay? But that's probably the easiest example that we can give. Now, we already know four meaning pairings below the word level, from classical structuralist to Syrian linguistics, and those are morphemes. Okay? If we got a paradigm like uh, untrue, unfriendly, unfaithful, unacceptable, in all of these we can see that, yes, there is a word, actually three, unfriendly, unacceptable, and unfaithful, but in each of these we can still identify subparts which carry form and meaning. 
and the meaning of unfriendly, untrue, and so on, is obviously always not friendly. So classical um, morphological theory, you would say that un is a prefix with the meaning not. Now, again, construction grammar comes along, hijacks it, and says morphemes are four meaning pairings, so they're also constructions, um, arbitrary and conventional. Now, if we think a bit more, um, and people in morphology have thought a lot about um, um, affixes, obviously, then um, we also got to think about the kind of restrictions and what else we know as speakers about how to use this um, construction. So un untrue, unreal, and unkind all work fine, and they follow the pattern that untrue is not true, unkind is not kind, so we've got the same mechanism there. Um, it doesn't work if you say an unman and an apple, the unhero, um, so that's not um, possible to uh, attach it to nouns, okay? So we've already got work class information. And to untie, to undo, and to uncover looks similarly on a formal level, but it has got a different meaning. To untie doesn't mean not tie, but it means something is tied and you um, undo the tying. And if you uncover something, it is covered, and you take away the cover. So a related but definitely a different meaning, and that's why also in morphology you would say there are different morphemes, and in construction grammar we would say there are two different types of constructions. A representation that then takes into account all of that, what we know about it, um, would give you a schema like this. And it's important, and we will pick this up in a second, construction grammar moves away from the ideas that we've got rules. So it's not, it's not morphemes that you stick together, but you've got a template, something like a foil that you can fill with appropriate items. Um, so what we've got here okay, is form and meaning, because that's what we said, a construction always needs to have form and meaning. Um, and on the meaning level, that's easy, we've got a semantic meaning, not something. And this not something carries a number, that's just one notational device, many different kind of formalisms are there, um, are out there, but um, this is one way of representing this, which I find is still one of the most um, intuitive ones, because we can see that this number two pops up in many other places, so that means this is an element that is linked. For number one, not, we know that it's the, the morpheme, the prefix un, and it's realized as this is a low open vowel followed by a nasal. This also gets the one. Okay? So if you look at the representation, you know the full meaning association is un, prefix, means not. And then you've got a slot, um, an, an open vacant gap where you put in appropriate material. But as we've seen in the previous example with the unman doesn't work, we need to specify what can go in that slot. We need restrictions um, on the kind of elements that can be licensed or unified, various different ways of putting this, but it's always the same idea. So here we've got the two, um, which just says X. This is unspecified because uh, friendly and true don't share any phonological properties that we can generalize. Okay, that's a very open slot phonologically, uh, no restrictions. On the morphological level, however, we specify that it's an adjective. Um, and it could also could be an adverb. It works the same way, but for, uh, for purposes of exposition, we've limited it to that. Um, and this, then, is linked to the meaning of another variable, and that's number two. And so if you stick in, um, for example, uh, happy with the string of sounds here, it is an adjective that checks out, and here the meaning is going to be happy, and the meaning of the full construction is not happy, and the realization on the phonological level is unhappy. Okay? Pretty simple. Uh, the first thing that we see, however, and um, that's important, so we saw words are four meaning pairings, called constructions. Morphemes are four meaning pairings called constructions. But this is already different in that it has got a slot. Okay? You can put in many different types of adjectives. If you come up with a new adjective in English, um, blick, might be one, no, no, no. but uh, assuming that blick uh, is, is not an, an, an existing English adjective, you would already know that you can say unblick. Okay? This was so blick, um, and then you can say unblick. Another example I found on the web was um, this is so un-Gucci, okay? which already gives you, because of the correspondence, that you know there is a property of being Gucci. Okay? This is Gucci, and you can also be un-Gucci. And that accounts for the creative potential. That's important. We don't just assume that you, uh, in a behavioristic kind of fashion, learn specific constructions and only reuse that, but there are mechanisms, and we will show them in the second part of this presentation, that you can get to this creative potential that you've got slots. Okay? That's already a very important point. But these slots are constrained, and you can't just put anything in there. Uh, you need to be specific in what um, is allowed. Okay. 
What we also see is that constructions become more complex. They've got an internal structure. In Apple, there was no internal structure. We just had one element, a string of sounds linked to one meaning. Here we've got sub-elements with form meaning correspondences. As I said, the un, for example, is linked to not, and the adjective provides um, the, um, the state or uh, the property that is being denied. And importantly, and this is already where we depart from the classical Saussurean sign, in Saussure, form is really just um, the string of sounds. Okay? There is no information on work class or anything else. Um, but the construction grammar approach to construction adds more. You've also got information on uh, work class and syntactic information. So form is going to be bigger than in Saussure, but it's the same notion. Okay? So far, so good. I know this first part is a bit a lot about us talking and introducing you to the ideas, but hopefully we're moving along at a pace which is okay. If not, please stop us at any moment in time. If there are any questions, um, if you want us to elaborate something, um, then I will have Alex do that. <laughs> okay, but as long as you don't stop me, I'm just going to sweep along. Okay, good. Now, as I said, it's important that we don't just relabel things. There are important theoretical repercussions why we do it. And one is that despite the fact that our morphological schema, the one that I've just shown you here for the unconstruction, looks a bit like a morphological approach, right? It just looks like a different way of putting it. Um, but it's important to remember that in a morpheme-based approach, if you identify morphemes classically, um, then you've got the morpheme un, and you stick it to the adjective, and you get an adjective. Okay, a combinatorial process, an additive process. A schema works differently. A schema isn't just about attaching stuff, it's about filling stuff. And more importantly, we don't assume that there are rules which take one thing and change it into something else, but there is a relationship between two elements. So instead of saying that this is a rule, we've got a bidirectional relationship between the adjective, the X2, which we just had, in our case, for example, true, T or U on the pronunciation level is an adjective on the morphological level. It means true, not false. Um, and here you've got the um, unadjective construction, which got the slot for that. And that's why you've got a word-based approach, um, a relationship between true and untrue, between the full forms. Why is that important, or where does it make a difference? In classical morphology, oh, sorry, that, the, the taps sort of got um, displaced. Um, we know that there are paradigms, things like um, attract, attraction, attractive, suggest, suggestion, suggestive, prohibit, prohibition, prohibitive. Okay? If you take a morphological approach, then these seem pretty straightforward. There are minor flaws in the pronunciation, but you just assume, okay, I've got a verb attract, I add chun, and I get the noun attraction as a suffix. And if I add um, if to attract, attract if, I get an adjective. Okay? So far there, a rule-based and a construction grammar word-based approach wouldn't differ. Okay? They would give you the same result. We would do it differently, but it wouldn't have any empirical dif um, different predictions. But what we also know from morphology, and these things, um, sort of, there are many of them, that not everything can be explained in morphology using morphemes. Okay, there are many non-morphological word formation processes. Um, clippings, for example, take stuff off. Um, airplane, um, plane, okay, that's um, uh, another example of a clipping. Um, fridge. Hmm? fridge. Fridge from refrigerator. What you clip off isn't really a meaning uh, of morpheme. It hasn't got meaning, but you clip something off which sort of is still got form. So there you can't work with morphemes. Um, Zero derivations are problematic. Um, alphabetisms, acronyms, those kind of things where you rely on orthography uh, like NSA or NASA. Um, there you can't have morphemes. Okay? And in this case, um, if you think about it, we just said, I need to go back to this slide. In a morphological approach, you got a one directional rule. You got an input, you stick the morphemes together, you get an output. For things like illusion and elusive, aggression and aggressive, we know that they're related in exactly the same kind of way as attraction and attractive, suggestion and suggestive, but there is no verb in English, uh, elusive or aggress. 
Okay? If you just have a morphological rule-based approach, you cannot generate these easily because you haven't got a verb in the input. Okay? You've only got the output of the rule. And that's why many people have argued that um, a morphological approach is problematic and that what we've instead go have got is a storage of these individual items like illusion, aggression, attraction and suggestion and they give you a schema, as we just said, and you've got a schema for attractive, suggestive and prohibitive. And of course they will be related because they've got a common core, a similarity in form, but you don't need to derive one from the other. The idea is that people learn these words and they've got a schema for verb, they've got this one here for nouns and then they get a schema for the adjective and once they've got the schemas they will see the morphological correspondences so that you know if you've got one you've also got the other. So this is the idea, bi-directional relationships between um, and just so that we sort of uh, entrench this, you've got the phonology of a verb that ends for example in a t and that means to do something, um, attract, for example, um, attracting uh, someone. Uh, the then if you have shun, if you add that, instead of the t, because it's not attract, sh attract, ch chun, but attraction, okay, no uh, Africa, ch, but just the uh, fricative, sh. Um, and you also don't have to, uh, have to have some morphological change in all of that because it's just um, the, um, the, the schema that relates to it. That's the noun and it's the action of doing that thing. So attract relates to attraction. And we've got um, if as a schema, um, attractive. And there it's prone to doing um, A. Um, and in all of these, you don't assume that one is primary and the other is secondary. Okay? And you don't assume that you've got a one-directional rule. Um, but to go back to this, um, in the schema approach, as I said, it's also possible to go from the output to the alleged input. Okay? Rule-based, there's always a clear input that gives you a result. In this, you've got a correspondence between two forms which you've established because of a uh, different type of input. You've seen many of the uh, unverbs and you've uh, unadjectives, and you've seen many of the normal adjectives. This also means that if I was uh, on the internet, I came across Anguchi first, the result, I'm able to go back and say, oh, well, if it's Anguchi, then it must also be a Gucci. Okay? I can go back and say, because these two schemas are related, I can also drive the other way and add Gucci to my network without having heard it. I hear un Gucci and I know that uh, all of the um, uh, adjectives that got the un are also exist without the un, so I can make this generalization. If you've got a one-way street and you got un Gucci, then it's not easy to get back here. Okay? You need another mechanism because that rule is only one way. So far so good? Um, so that's why I said there is a difference, despite the fact that they just look like a new formalism, a new way of putting things, but there are important empirical issues why we do it that way, why schemas are preferred. And that's not just something that constructions, constructionists have been doing. Um, um, word and paradigm theories in morphology have been doing exactly the kind of thing for, um, for decades now. But from a construction grammar point of view, with the schemas that we've got, this is exactly kind of uh, what we follow. So we also tap into uh, word-based approaches in morphology and not morphological ones. I mean, so far we've talked about things which all of you would have subscribed to the fact that they've got meaning, right? Form meaning, words and morphemes. Um, but now we need to move on and extend this um, to show that construction grammar can do more then just talk about morphology and, and lexicology, um, and as we shall see, that it's actually a full-fledged theory of language. Um, so I just put this again um, as a mnemonic device because it's so important, so I've now put it into the linguistic sign uh, slide that you saw earlier. That's the um, unfair, untrue, and so on, where we said form also includes information on syntax and morphological information. Um, it's important that these are uh, so-called partly schematic, that's an important term. Uh, we talk about a schematic construction if it has got slots, okay, variables that you can fill in, um, and these variable slots make it productive. And as Alex said, importantly, this construction is straightforwardly compositional. You add one part 
and on the semantic level, the meaning of this is added to not, or not has got scope over it, so that you get the right kind of meaning. But these are not the only types of constructions. So we've got constructions which are words, we've got constructions which are smaller than words, and now we're talking about constructions that are bigger than words. If we look at these two idioms, he kicked the bucket and she spilled the beans. Does anyone know what they mean? They're standard textbook examples. He kicked the bucket. Mm -hmm. Spilled the beans. Tell secret, divulge the information, that kind of thing. Now, it's interesting if we think about it, again, we all, especially as second language learners, we know that these have to be learned. And native speakers also learn them because they're not compositional, right? Which means that the individual parts, like the bucket and kick, if you put them together, the kicking action with your leg and a bucket, you're not going to get the meaning die. It's something you need to learn, something we've all learned as second language speakers. Similar in spilled the beans. But what is interesting, okay, now we can see where this is heading, we're going to call them a construction, and they have to be learned, and they're bigger than words, but more interestingly, they are also different, okay? Um, so even with idioms, we find that they're not all alike, different degrees of idiomaticity. If you look at the bucket was kicked, then you can pass it and get a meaning, but the meaning will always be one of actual kicking. Okay? It flew through the room. But you cannot get the meaning of um, died. Okay? It's not the passive of someone died. Um, that doesn't work. In the beans were spilt, on the other hand, that works. Okay? That's a perfectly acceptable passive sentence. And now you get the fact that we've got a passive construction that it can interact with idioms, which in a classical definition are normally really fixed chunks that you learn, and if you learn a chunk, you don't usually manipulate it. Right? It's like a, a, a big pile of something that's just glued together. Now, if you follow the format that we've just had, from a construction grammar analysis, we can not only treat them easily as constructions, but we can also see how this different emerges from the way they are stored. So take kick the bucket. Linguistic sign, arbitrary and conventional, um, and obviously you've got a noun phrase here acting as a subject that is the X, that's why it's got the two, the person that dies. So um, John kicked the bucket, John will be the semantic um, participant that is affected, that dies, and it's the subject. And then kick I put this in capital letters because um, it's the lexeme representation because you can also have he kicked the bucket, he has kicked the bucket, he is kicking the bucket. There you need coercion because of the semantics of um, um, the, the verb and the progressive meaning, but still um, it will work. And then the bucket and that's fixed. I just put the phonology here, that's how you pronounce it and you don't change this. Now, in terms, again, of what the levels mean, the relationship between form and meaning, this is a complex construction because we can assign one element, the noun phrase, as the affected entity. And the verbal meaning of to die is associated with all of this in orange. doesn't come out well on this with a color, but kick the bucket. Kick the bucket as a whole is associated with the meaning die. Okay. Um, and we can do this straightforwardly. I indicated this by the one. If we now look at spill the beans, you've got a similar aspect. Okay? You've got the noun phrase, and that's the person doing the spilling of the beans. Again, associated um, here, form level, it's a slot. It just has to be a noun phrase, and this is associated with this meaning participant. But um, spill and the beans, unlike kick the bucket, I'm just going to jump back. In kick the bucket, this whole thing just means die. You don't analyze it any further. In spill the beans, however, you do analyze it into parts. And if you, in your paraphrases that you gave, you already indicated this. Tell secrets. Okay? You were able to give a paraphrase for the verb, for the verbal meaning, and you were able to give a paraphrase for the uh, following noun phrase, um, the beans. So following the format that we've introduced, we can say that spill in this construction, lexeme again, because he spilled, has spilled the beans and so on, is associated with the meaning of divulge, tell, however you want to represent this. But the beans also has got an extra meaning. It's associated with a meaning information or secrets. Okay? So now we get a complex construction in which we get more subparts, which is the difference between kick the bucket and um, spill the beans. Um, and in a way, it is still compositional, you know, because you've got parts and you stick them together. 
Okay, because we've got the parts noun phrase, spill, and the beans, three parts. We stick them together. We identify individual meaning for all three parts. The noun phrase is um, um, still the participant here, and the beans is the information, and the verbal meaning of spill is divulge. So compositional, in the strict sense of sticking stuff together. What makes this an idiom is, however, that it's a non-conventional meaning that these items have. Okay? The, the beans don't have the meaning information in any other construction. It's only in this construction that it gets linked to the meaning information. Okay? Um, so this is again something that, because you can specify um, the meaning of these elements in a holistic way in one construction, you can make the difference between kick the bucket, where you say that's an idiom, um, which has got a non-conventional meaning for kick and the bucket, and it as a whole means something else than in other sentences where it means kicking. Um, and in uh, spill the beans, you can say that both elements, the verb and the following noun phrase, the beans, have a non-conventional meaning specific to the construction. But in addition to that, it's got um, a compositional setup. Okay? The individual parts can be identified. And if you now think um, again to the passives, then it becomes clear why you can have the beans were spilt because we store this as a full meaning element, right? It's associated as a sub-element, as an individual part, which gets its own index, and then you can put it into the passive construction as the subject. In spill and uh, kick the bucket, you couldn't do that, because the bucket isn't an individual element with meaning. It's just part of kick the bucket. Okay, so even on the levels of idioms, you know, where, again, everyone would say you need to store them, we can distinguish with the machinery that construction grammar provides us with, um, namely the fact that you look at form and meaning at the same time and their association, we're able to tell the two apart and still put them in the same kind of format that we had. They're all form meaning pairings. Okay? Now we've got to move beyond idioms because we said it's a full-fledged syntactic theory. Time. Okay. So could he shriek himself unconscious? All of those are attested examples. That's also very important because in construction grammar, um, we always try to, f to look at the actual language use and not say people don't use it, but we want to see what people actually do and then explain this. Firefighters cut the man free and he'd often drunk himself silly. That's probably a very frequent example. Okay. Now I would argue... You know, if you've got any experience with any other syntactic theories, um, it's pretty easy to say how these would work compositionally, right? Normally, um, you've got words, and you put them into syntactic rules, and you get sentences. Now, abstracting away from these specific examples, can you give me another sentence with shriek? Sorry? Yeah, he shrieked in panic. Or you could obviously just say he shrieked. She shrieked. Okay. So if we did a normal um, work class analysis, what kind of a work class, what kind of a verb is shriek? It's an intransitive verb. Okay. Intransitive means it doesn't have an object. Now if you look at one, could he shriek himself unconscious? There's an object here. Okay. So how does that pop up? If shriek is normally an intransitive verb, which just means to do something, and it's got no object, where do we get the object from? And if you look at the meaning of this, you don't just get... Uh, an object, but in a kind of very structuralist, quirkian um, analysis, um, you also get an object complement, right? So, could he shriek? Himself is the object, and himself equals unconscious. Classical um, complex transitive structure. Same thing with firefighters cut the man free. Any standard kind of example with to cut? <coughs> he cuts an apple, okay? So, it's a monotransitive verb. The verb itself, licenses as an object. But again, firefighters cut the men free is slightly different, okay? Because you get the free as well, and if you compare, um, he cut the apple, we know that the apple is affected and is being cut, but they cut the man free, they shouldn't cut the man, okay? If the firefighters are very, very careful. Instead, the man becomes free, just like he himself becomes unconscious by shrieking. And of course, if you look at the final example, it works the same way. You drink something, so conceptually there's a drinker and something that is consumed, something that is drunk. Um, he drinks a beer. But in this case, it's again um, different because he doesn't drink himself. 
Okay, it's not that kind of object, but he drinks himself into a state where he becomes silly. Again, complex transitive. In an approach, in a kind of standard syntactic approach, where you've got words and rules, this is really difficult to explain. Why? Because, well, the things that got meaning are the words. Okay, so you would assume that a diatransitive verb or a, or a monotransitive verb uh, comes to the syntax and tells you how many participants it needs. And then the syntax just gives you well-formed sentences but doesn't care about the meaning. In these cases, however, it's pretty clear that because the, the syntactic rules are meaningless, they don't carry meaning, they shouldn't introduce meaning, that's one of the tenets um, of many syntactic approaches. But if you do that, you cannot account the different meanings of the verbs in these constructions, and you cannot account the extra objects, and you cannot describe the different meaning of this object as well as these object complements. Their presence is not explained. Okay? So, and this is not going to come as a surprise to you, what we do from a construction grammar perspective is to say, well, it's a constructional schema. And if we look at this, we can put this into exactly the same kind of format that we had before. Okay? We've got a complex construction. This time, completely open, completely schematic, just slots. But we say in these slots, you can have a subject, a verb, an object, and an oblique. And the meaning of this is that the subject is linked on the semantic level to A, which causes B, the object, to become C, that's expressed by the oblique, by V, so the verb expresses the specific verbal action by which this comes about. Okay? And again, the idea is that this is an abstract schema, just like untrue, unfriendly, and unfair lead to un plus slot. And because we've got so many examples like um, he shrieked himself unconscious, um, the firefighters cut the man free, they elected him president, that would be a lexical uh, template for it. Um, because of all these similar kinds of tokens, people can generalize to the schema and say subconsciously, oh right, I need a subject, a verb, and then this object becomes whatever I add as the oblique. Okay? expression cut uh, somebody free, I think. You can mm -hmm. also say cut somebody loose. Mm -hmm. You can just use some other. So I suppose that there's always certain kind of, let's say, productivity or even just taking some risks or challenges, trying just to construct something new in terms of expressivity or also at the same time because you really do not have acquired the schematic mm -hmm. uh, pattern just exactly as it should have just been acquired. So you can just be tentative and you can just use approximate kind of expressions. Absolutely, absolutely. And this is uh, a, a very important point because what we're going to see is the question how the schemas arise in people so that they can use it creatively is going to depend also on specific tokens, on specific uses. Just like I said, uh, they elected him president. That's going to come up very often, and that is one instance. Um, and if you hear someone to cut someone loose, then you will also know, oh, that is similar to they cut, them, they cut him free. And only because you're exposed to the specific instances will you be able to generalize to the schema. And the individual instances, from a usage-based perspective, I'm jumping ahead a bit, they're also not going to be equally stored. There are going to be some which you hear more often, and in the kind of um, mental representation model, and that's also been supported by psycholinguistics, um, is the fact that if you hear something more often, it's going to be more deeply entrenched, so it might be a more important instance of your schema, a more prototypical one. And others which you haven't heard before might not be so deeply entrenched. Um, but then, of course, you still need the schema. If someone says something that you haven't heard before, um, so that you haven't exposed, so not just the specific tokens are stored, like elect or cut loose, but if I say, that's from a Douglas Adams book, um, she smiled herself uh, an upgrade, okay? Because you've got the schema, despite the fact that you've never heard it, you will know what it means. By smiling, she was able to get an upgrade. Okay, so we need the schemas for the creative use, but there's also going to be specific lexicalizations which support it, and which are also going to be stored. That's a non-redundant way of storage. You store individual tokens, unfriendly, untrue, unhelpful, from a usage-based perspective, but then you generalize to a schema. And then depending, um, and this is going to come up again, then depending on how, how deeply something is entrenched, for example, unfriendly, you might have heard so often that you're always going to go for the full form and produce it. 
Whereas if you've got Anguchi, okay, that's new, you've got to go to the schema. And they're going to be in competition, and which one you're going to choose is depend on how deeply the token is entrenched. And all of this, and that's also why I sort of uh, already, already talk about this, is going to be very important for what Alex is going to say about the history of English, um, how specific tokens interact with the constructionalization of elements, and also what I'm going to have to say about um, syntactic synchronic variation, or synchronic variation in general. There's a small footnote. I mean, this is, this is just an anecdote, but I think there's, there's some deeper truth behind that, the mm. question of entrenchment and how, mm, what kind of access you have to these schemata that, that are available. Because I once had the pleasure of giving a talk to a group of elderly ladies in Massachusetts, all native speakers of English, and I was using that Douglas Adams quote uh, mm. because I was trying to make the same point. And I said, oh, she smiled herself an upgrade, uh, exemplifies. And they looked at me, it's like, what does it mean? We don't get it, mm -hmm. right? So apparently they didn't have really access to that schema. Mm -hmm. I mean, they could parse the firefighters in all these examples. That was mm -hmm. no problem. But the, the, that was just too exotic for them. And even when I told them what it means, they were like, you can't say that. That's mm -hmm. weird. You don't do it. The, the, the point is that, uh, well, on the one hand, entrenchment is absolutely mm -hmm. the, the important concept here, but also how much consciously you can play around with these schemata, right? So how much exposition you've had and how, how much freedom you perceive there as a footnote. So that's, a, that's an area for future res research, I guess. Yeah, in particular, if I can just add to that, if you think about it, there's also explicit prescriptive knowledge of grammar where you say one shan't say that, you shouldn't say that, and th th those shan't say shan't. You shan't say shan't, shouldn't, shouldn't I? Um, so there are prescriptive rules, and there are conscious knowledge, obviously. But I think from a construction grammar approach, what we could say, they're also going to be, to a certain degree, constructions for meaning pairings that just override um, unconscious knowledge. So um, I think that's one of the things where you wouldn't just separate domains, but you would say that these things should still be captured by a similar format. Okay. Right. So with a resultative construction, that's again fully schematic and productive. Um, for some speakers, that's going to be d different, as we've just seen with the elder ladies, depending on how often they heard it. Um, and it's compositional. Okay? Once, you, once you know how in this specific construction the form and the meaning link, then it's compositional, because you stick it together. Okay. So since we've already sort of moved into this area... Um, now we've got the format, and that was the very important fundamental part where we say, okay, we've got constructions um, as um, a full meaning pairing that is relevant for morphology, because we can explain how morphemes work, we can explain how words work, we can explain how idioms work, and syntactic phrases um, are also going to work the same way. Okay? And that's probably the biggest selling point of construction grammar. You've got a uniform explanation for what used to be lexical, and morphological analyses as well as uh, syntactic analysis. We've already talked about how usage, how, how what we actually do influences our knowledge of language and how we store it. This approach um, draws on so-called usage-based approaches. Um, um, Joan Bybee has done a lot of work on that um, and is probably um, one of the most important people publishing on this. And from a construction grammar view, this is by now boring, Constructions are mental. <laughs> they, they can drive you mental, but they are part of your mental knowledge. That's important. We don't assume, because in a structuralist analysis, if you remember that, we started with Saussure, it would be something that a speech community shares, but you wouldn't worry too much about whether an individual has stored it. We would definitely make this claim. It's a mental theory. It's what people, speakers do and what people have in their heads. As we've tried to show, it's constructions all the way. From morphemes to syntax, you should only draw on um, constructions and not words against rules. And the input for these mental representations is actual usage, what people hear, input. Input is important. As we've already said, input isn't just treated in a behavioristic kind of way. You hear something, you store it, and you can only reproduce, like the Pavlovian dog, what you've heard before. But people have got general cognitive processes that have been identified for other um, uh, areas in psychology, and something like generalization to give you a schema so that out of untrue, unfriendly, and unhappy, you're able to do something with it and not just reuse those, but come up with a more general template. Okay? That's something that humans are capable of and that helps us um, to become creative. These specific usage events, and this is something that Alex and I um, sort of 
very recently sort of moved more and more into this realm um, about context and the effects of what, what this includes. Because even so far what we've shown you is phonological representation of form that's pretty abstract, that abstracts from the actual phonetic use, um, which is actually what people hear. Um, and so what Bybee points out, that this information that you get with an individual token uh, consists of phonetic detail, including redundant and variable features, and those are going to be important for variation and change. The lexical items, constructions used, meaning, inferences made from this meaning, including pragmatics, um, and from context, and properties of the social, physical, and linguistic context. Okay? So even who you speak to, which situation it is, is in, um, all of the factors which are Im particularly important in social linguistics, right? that certain forms can be indexical of you being from a certain area, regional variation, or indexical of you being part of a certain social group, a certain social class, all of these things will also have to be factored in. And in a template where you've got form and meaning, once you open up meaning also to pragmatic and social linguistic meaning, it again allows you to encompass a much wider range of data and to, to say something and to provide something for social linguistics um, than many other uh, linguistic theories. And in some you can say that uh, construction grammar in some sense is even a misnomer because mm. either, either you say that grammar is a very, very wide mm. thing and now includes pragmatic, stylistic, social mm. information or actually what we're talking about is actually a full-fledged linguistic theory. Mm. So uh, it, it really gives you a very broad idea of linguistic knowledge, structural linguistic knowledge. So instead of separating the different levels and domains and saying, well, that's the core, that's syntax, mm. and that does all the grammatical stuff, and then there's stylistic somewhere, but that's on top and doesn't really matter, that's mm. use. It's all included here, and that gives you a really an almighty approach, if you like. And uh, s just a very quick look ahead. I mean, so far we've seen lots of stuff in syntax, of course, so the argument structure mm -hmm. constructions have been well studied. We've seen a little bit in, in morphology. We're beginning to work on the stylistic, social, and other aspects. And uh, again, this is one of the fields where we need more research in the future. And same with history and language change. We've, ha we've had the first monograph. So. Mm -hmm. So far, we think there's good reason to believe that all of that stuff is in construction grammar, but we still need more data, theory, examples, and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. Sorry. You're absolutely right. Of course I am. <laughs> okay. So for the format that we've introduced, it's a bit more complicated, but still full meaning. Okay? Just like we started out um, earlier this morning. Um, now we say that this full thing is a construction and form, and we've seen this throughout. We're going to have phonological information, morphological information, and syntactic properties. That's what we saw for unfair. We need to know that it attaches to adjectives, that the full thing is an adjective. So you need syntactic information as well. You can't just blend this out. On the meaning level, you've got semantics. That's pretty straightforward, though when we talk about what kind of semantics we have, we'll also have something to say on this. Pragmatic properties. Um, that certain constructions, and we all know that, need to be used in certain situations. It's pretty straightforward with greetings. Okay, good morning only works if you pragmatically say it in the morning. If you wake up at night, different inferences are going to be drawn from that if you um, do that. Um, but there are many um, thanks responses that you say thank you and you're welcome. Many of these things are pragmatically um, situated um, and therefore, that's important that we also keep in mind that kind of context, speaker, hearer, situation. Um, and discourse functional properties, um, and this is a very wide term, also in terms of where something can be used in the discourse, um, anaphors, uh, um, anaphora and that kind of thing. But on top of that, also what Alex and I just pointed out towards social information. Okay? So what kind of role am I indexing by the use of a certain uh, property um, as, for example, um, a speaker of a very um, standard variety to indicate a certain class, or if I go for a certain regional variety. And all of that opens up the kind of um, the whole issue of social linguistics, social identity, um, which I will be talking about on Tuesday, if you think to the studies by Lebov in New York, Martha's Vineyard, um, audience design, and varieties of English around the world, if you're working on that. I mean, these have got uh, a high um, indexical value for the people in the post-colonial context. It's not just a variety. It's an official language. It comes with certain um, 
um, social linguistic repercussions, education, chance to promotion, and so on. Um, and all these things will have to be included in, the, in these linguistic forms. Okay. And of course, these are linked, and that's the symbolic bit, which basically says this is arbitrary. Okay, different languages will have different constructions. Um, that's something that Bill Croft always um, points out, that we're going to see a wide different array of um, constructions from a typological point of view. Um, and we need to look at each individual language first to see how they, for example, express a resultative construction. And then we can look at German or Spanish. And we can ask ourselves, do they, they should behave roughly similar if they've got a similar meaning, um, because then conceptually people would have the same kind of cognitive representations. But there's also going to be language-specific differences. And these are important to um, keep an open eye for. Okay. So the range of classic construction grammar as from morphology to, um, to syntax, that's... Um, sort of um, a combination of, of various overviews, but these are usually given to give an idea. Everything that we've got in this right-hand column is considered a construction, and you've got a shorthand notation of the form here. We would also have to give the meaning, of course. <coughs> but you get things um, with a traditional name from syntax, subcategorization, sub so the consume has got a subject and an object. It's a, normally a ditransitive verb. You've got idioms that kick the bucket and spill the beans. Morphology, plural and tense on verbs, syntactic categories, something as a noun, an adjective, as well as specific words. And with respect to classification, okay, we say that we've got things which are substantive, and substantive is a term for the phonology is fixed, you've got no variables, okay? you can't do anything creative with those, green, anaconda, um, or even an idiom, like that's the way the cookie crumbles, so that's, again, an idiom with a specific meaning. That's the way things are. You can't do anything about them. Um, and in British English, you can't just say, um, that's the way the cookie crushes or whatever. It okay? doesn't work. There's one specific stored element. But again, completely substantive um, and stored to a specific meaning. And then we've got the so-called schematic ones, where, you, as you will remember, there are slots. And these slots can be something like a noun in the plural construction, cats, dogs, horses with their elomorphy. Um, up to something like the, um, this is the ditransitive construction, subject, verb, object, object. He gave her a book, he sent her the money, um, he emailed um, Bill the presentation. Again, um, um, creative pattern for which you've seen many individual tokens that lead to the entrenchment of this um, syntactic phrasal construction. Yeah. Though just to be fair, um, there's also some discussion, of course, in the construction grammar community about those very schematic syntactic constructions, mm -hmm. because obviously, for some of them, it's very hard to identify their meaning. Mm -hmm. um, with the ditransitive, it's f still fairly simple, I think, so you've seen that before, so somebody does something to somebody, roughly. Mm -hmm. But if we talk about something like a subject predicate construction, which somebody stipulates, uh, some, some people stipulate, mm -hmm. I find it a lot harder to say what is the meaning of subject predicate because it's not always somebody does something. It can be uh, lots of different things. So, and it's just fair to say that there, there's in, in the theoretical community there's still some debate about where to draw the line, what the boundary is, and how to capture these things. So, again, that's some, some area that still needs more thinking. Mm -hmm. And this um, is probably best illustrated in, in this particular type of representation. That is one way because we said the const uh, we, we don't call it the lexicon anymore because, as you've seen, we include phrasal constructions like the resultative or passive constructions. So it's not just words that we've stored in our mind. And because we, th we say it's all constructions, we call it the constructicon by analogy. Um, Filmer was one of the first to use it in the 80s. Yeah. Um, Pustajowski? Okay. Um, so it's been around for some time. But it basically means um, your mental knowledge of construction. And now the important point is that you don't just have like a, a large bag in your mind and you stuff all these individual constructions in there and they're jumbling around and they've got nothing to do with each other. But of course we know that our mind stores information in patterns and it puts together things which are similar. And of course, things which are similar on a form and meaning level should be more closely tied together than things which just have uh, a similar form. So we come up with 
one way of expressing this is the idea that there are taxonomies. A taxonomy, um, you probably know that from, from other areas, um, from um, psychology, and, and Roche has done a, a lot of examples on that. If you think about um, birds as a category that you're exposed to, then you, of course, know that you've got this, I should say this is um, birds, okay, that you've got specific birds, like a robin or a blackbird, um, you name it. So the, and we also store information about that. Okay? So um, you store information on two levels. Specific exemplars that you see, and you put them in the bin. Oh, that's a robin, that's a blackbird, that's an eagle, that's a seagull. And because of perceived similarities in form and what they do, cognitively you also categorize them on a higher level as birds. Okay? And then if you see something um, that you've never seen before and it's green, sparkly and it flies and it's got the feathers and the beaks and flies around the, in the air, then you can say, oh, that fit, fits my category of a bird. Okay? I might not know what specific bird it is, but I can classify it as a bird. This is how um, categorization works and it works in children very, very um, early on. Um, and one way of representing this, of saying you've got a superordinate, more abstract category like bird, and specific instances like robin, seagull, and so on, is to have a hierarchy. So, um, bird on, on a higher level, and then you get these individual elements. Then, of course, we also know that birds are animals. Okay, that's how humans conceptualize them. Um, so, f similar to fish and, and bears or what have you, vertebrae. Um, and then you've got a higher category, animals. Okay? And what we see here is exactly the same kind of thing. We assume that this is a g domain general property. Humans conceptualize things in this hierarchical way. Specific instances, more, ab more, more general abstractions, and higher abstractions, so that you put things together which you've got some kind of perceived similarity for. You do the same thing with constructions. Okay? You get individual instances, and now things like uh, jump and be happy would be instances of birds. Okay, certain type of birds, and you would say, okay, that's my seagull, jump, eat, drink, and so on. Um, different types of seagull, and you say, oh, they're all seagulls. And in the imperative construction in English, you know, you can say jump, eat, and drink. So you know that you can just use the verb with an exclamative pronunciation. There's also going to be, despite the fact that it's a slot, a verb has to go in there. There's a specific uh, phonological um, information and constraint, because you can't go up with it and jump. Okay, that would be a question. You've got to say jump. You've got to have a fall, and intonation is also part of phonological um, form. Um, but you will classify it in that way. And if you've got um, be happy, um, um, be jolly, um, be afraid, okay, all of those, um, you get specific instances, and then you would say, oh, they're all alike. I know that I can generalize to be adjective. Okay, and if a new adjective like uh, uh, Anguchi comes along, you can say, be Anguchi. Okay? And we can already, because we've got the schema, we've got a rough idea what that could mean. Okay? Um, okay. And then we've got the negatives. Um, don't jump, don't eat your greens, and you get the don't verb construction. Don't be cruel, um, don't be silly, and you get a construction, don't be adjective. Now, how do we come up with these taxonomies? Well, at, at this level, it's pretty easy because you've got these specific instances and you generalize to the bird level, to the, more, to the next um, one. When we now look at English, however, something interesting is happening here if you think about negation and if you think about the B adjectives. Um, if you normally got um, a sentence like, um, he is ill, and you negate it, the declarative, you get... He isn't ill. If you've got a verb like um, he eats an apple and you negate it, you get he doesn't eat an apple. You get do support. So verbs need do support. Adjectives don't in declaratives because you can just add the negator to be. Now, if this was true, sort of, regardless of the specific constructions, and this is an example from Croft and Cruz where they show that semantics can override syntax information, then if this was true, B is an auxiliary, it's a primary verb, it can take the negation, then, and historically at one point it did, um, then you, can, you should be able to say as a negative imperative, be not afraid. Okay? Because B is an auxiliary, it can take the negator, so if I just go by structure, that would work. 
but it's not like that. For imperatives, it classifies in a different way because they're always going to be introduced by don't. It's don't be cruel, not be not cruel, okay? So we can again see how these pattern together. So for the imperatives, the kind of splitting point, um, just like we separate animals from humans conceptually, with imperative constructions we separate positive imperatives from the negative ones. And in the negatives, they always got to be introduced by don't. And that's a specific requirement only these um, imperatives have, especially with the adjectives. That's a construction that everybody would have to assume is stored because you don't get it compositionally from the rules of English. Because if the other rules of English worked like that, you would just say be not, because be can take the negator. So you've got to look very carefully at how the taxonomy, how people come up with that, and the reasons that we've um, come up with this specific taxonomy is we look at form and meaning, okay? And of course, they all, under a big meaning of imperative, they've all got this imperative meaning. And then you've got to think about how the taxonomy splits them up, and in this language, in, in English, it's split up between positive and negative imperatives. And despite the fact that this is a terminology that is disputed, and some people would say it's on the way out, I, we, still think it's, it's helpful in talking about um, these taxonomies. Um, because what you get is, at a specific level, the specific examples, jump, be happy, um, don't worry, those would be micro-constructions, specific instances completely substantively filled, specific tokens of usage that people are exposed to. And these are stored in exactly the same, same kind of way as I just said. The more often you hear them, the more often it's going to be stored. If you don't ever hear something again, you might forget it. That's how the mind works. But normally, um, that's also something we know from psychology, you hold on to these specific examples. If you've got enough specific examples, you can generalize to the bird level. And if you then got instances like jump and be happy, you can say, okay, those are positive imperatives on a higher level, and that's the mesoconstructional level. Generalizations on a higher constructional level, which you generalize from the input, we call mesoconstructions. They're in the middle. And at the top, we get a macro construction. That's the idea that the, the macro construction is the most um, superordinate generalization we get for a couple of um, constructions. As Alex already pointed out, this is where it gets controversial. Or not controversial, but where we have to think about, is this a construction in the sense of a form meaning schema? If so, we would have to say, what's its meaning? For imperatives, you could probably roughly say um, an interactive device, very often used as an order, though if you look at specific imperatives as people have done in English, very often they are um, sort of not orders for someone, but suggestions or um, directional devices, um, open your books on page, something like that. Um, but that would be easy, but what would be the form? Okay, what kind of generalization could you give? In those we see um, all verbs, okay, that's be plus an adjective, that's fine, and don't verb and don't be adjective. And for the negatives we can say don't, plus something, that's a generalization. And here we've only got pret phrase, okay, because they are so different in, in form, what kind of generalization could you give, apart from the fact that it's not negative? And then at this level, what have they got in common on the formal level? Okay, only this pret phrase and what exactly is that? So there are two possibilities. One is that humans, because of categorization um, properties, have a schematic uh, construction of sorts that is extremely abstract. Or that this is just something that we as linguists put here, okay? that it's not a real construction, but it's an expression of the fact that people, of course, will perceive the similarities between these because they've got um, similarities on the form and meaning level. Okay? A bit like priming, um, so that um, a bug, um, if you talk about an insect and bug as in a spy device, okay, we know they prime each other because they've got a similar form. The mind associates things with a similar form and connects them more closely together. In this case, we've got form and meaning similarities. They're all imperatives, interactional devices, um, but perhaps this is not a construction, but just a link in the mental constructicon between these, an expression that there are form meaning similarities. And this is the most controversial part because it's very hard to empirically argue um, for either of the two. 
Because all of the individual items, even the creative ones, okay, be Gucci if you do that. You could license by this construction here, by a meso construction. You don't need the macro construction to come up with the new stuff. Okay? So for this level here, we've got good evidence because you can create new creative patterns which need to rely on the schema. Higher up the end, it's very hard to say what would be the advantage of that. That's why these are controversial, but for the purpose of exposition and for thinking about these four meaning similarities between meso constructions, we still feel it's a helpful mnemonic device. Yeah, maybe I can just jump in here and say, well, the, the, uh, the person who invented this distinction between micro, meso, and macro was Elizabeth Traugott. And, and uh, at the time, it was very helpful. Uh, now she's abandoned it in mm -hmm. favor of micro constructions. She still has them. Mm -hmm. But I think on top of that, she now has macro schemas. So she dropped the meso level altogether mm -hmm. and is talking about schemas. Um, well, I, I still like the meso level. Uh, but there's another thing that we're working on right now, um, Elizabeth and I, and that's the idea that um, there could be two different axes in the Constructicon, if you like. What you mm -hmm. see here, that's kind of the textbook Catholic way of looking at things, um, which is fine and makes perfect sense, especially mm -hmm. from a very formal perspective. You talked about licensing mm -hmm. and modeling that and running things on a computer to see if it's actually plausible to assume mm -hmm. that, which is absolutely fine. At the same time, when we stick with the imperative here for a second, um, when we look at the meaning side, of course, we have lots of other constructions that have do the same job. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, the, the want-to construction. You want to turn left at the traffic lights is an imperative. It means you turn left there, or turn left there, actually. Mm -hmm. Um, how, and I was always wondering, how does that fit in? Is there any connection between the two? Because if you just look at that particular diagram, there wouldn't be any connection because there's no formal relationship between you want to turn left and turn left. But this structural relationship has been at the focus of construction grammar for many, many years. So if you look at Goldberg, if you look at Michaelis and all the others, they always build their networks on structural principles mm -hmm. for a reason. I'm not saying they're wrong, right? So in terms of testing it, that's, that's and licensing, that's very important. At the same time, Elizabeth and I were now thinking that it might be uh, interesting to introduce a second dimension, if you like. So if you think about different planes, so we have this, the, the two-dimensional thing that we have here, and if you now go into, into the depth, right, you could add a second level where constructions could be linked by meaning and not by form. So. I like to talk about families, so I would say there's an imperative family which is linked by meaning and it contains all the different structures that we have to express imperatives, right? These are not linked by form anymore, or maybe sometimes by form, but they can also be linked by meaning. And this is really hot off the press, so we have a special issue of constructions and frames coming out later this year, early next year, where uh, we talk about that a little bit and the options here of modeling semantic spaces and seeing constructions actually located in semantic spaces and not just in structural dimensions. So this is really one of the hottest, I, for me personally, one of the hottest research areas that we have right now. So modeling the Constructicon, trying to figure that out. Especially since now there's more and more empirical evidence coming up that speakers on the one hand process stuff structurally. Mm -hmm. So as you said, I mean, we recognize patterns. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, we can also now test speakers in that they also arrange things by meaning. Mm -hmm. So I can prime them and I can get them to sort stuff by meaning. Well, that's something we're working on right now to see if we can get anywhere with that. And I think it, it also summarizes if you look at the body of work of research that's been done in construction grammar, um, perhaps because it started out as, as a syntactic theory, also most of the publications were focused on constructions from a formal perspective, so things which look formally similar and then you would analyze them. And it's only sort of in the last couple of years that, and we've, we've always said it's a, uh, a combination of form and meaning, that meaning should pay um, sort of, or should have the same kind of role and the people should also look at that. And one has to admit that many publications including some of mine, um, meaning was only treated very sort of briefly, okay? So, um, but I think, and Alex is absolutely right, um, that in terms of what speakers do, meaning is going to be very crucial, not just in conceptualization, but in language production, because you don't just use similar forms, but you've got a whole range of semantically um, available options that you choose, and that is something that S we need. Syntactically available. Hmm? Syntactically available options. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
interesting uh, discussion. Mm -hmm. Firstly, because the imperative is a different kind of mode, grammatically speaking. Mm -hmm. So it's a uh, form, meaning, and the way you express that meaning. Mm -hmm. I think that, as you said before, and I think it's quite interesting, you can just have several equivalent expressions to convey the same, let's say, speech act or the same idea. And uh, I suppose that one thing is the grammar, another thing is the pattern, the structure, and another thing is how to cater for, how to classify when you just mm -hmm. present uh, or you use a different kind of uh, mode, a different mm -hmm. kind of family or a grammatical form that uh, conveys or that is normally associated with one particular kind of function. It's a very interesting and intriguing aspect. Yeah, and um, since you. you said speech act, I mean, that's exactly it, that um, um, if we think about pragmatics, which we want to include in the constructions, right, then things like uh, the classic, you get in the room and it's cold in here, that kind of thing, where you want someone um, as an elocutionary act to uh, close a window, um, then of course that's a kind of, um, the pragmatics is probably sort of first in the production, and the, the pragmatics will lead you to a range of available options, and then you will pick. Mm. Yeah. Absolutely. Although so far we really conceptualize this ne not, not as a contrast or something that contradicts itself, but we really want to arrive at a picture where you have both things mm -hmm. happening at the same time simultaneously. As I said, one dimension is form, the second or the third dimension in that case is, is function, mm -hmm. and then, as I said, we now need to figure out how to formalize the whole thing and empirically test mm -hmm. it so that it doesn't really run counter to the important things that uh, syntacticians actually mm -hmm. discover. I mean, we need to acknowledge that as well. So big hot new thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, when we talk about usage-based approaches, so far we said all construction grammar approaches assume compositionality. Um, that's not, because sometimes, you know, you hear the criticism that um, construction grammar is just about idioms and about sort of margins, but it's not the case. We also try to cover all of the compositional stuff as well, but we say it's exactly modeled in the same kind of way as the idioms. Um, Usage-based construction grammars um, assume that fully compositional structures can be stored as well, however. So just because something is compositional, as in unfriendly, it doesn't mean you're going to hear it and forget it. Okay? We assume you hear something, you store it, you hear it again, it's going to get more deeply entrenched. You don't lose the specific micro-constructions just because you've come up with a macro-construction. Okay? You keep both. That's the important bit. If you hear them often enough, and we will see what often means in this context, how we can formalize this. And the more schematic and productive constructions only arise due to the generalization from input. And that's why input, in contrast to uh, mainstream generative approaches, plays such a huge role in usage-based approaches. And this is exactly what we see in language acquisition, that specific instances come first. It has been called the one-word stage, but as Thomas Seller points out, they're not really words in the sense that they are simple for meaning pairings. But if kids produce things like uh, birdie, let me see, and want a ball, they treat it as one unit, but these are rich, pragmatic um, devices. Okay? They express a rich, semantic, and pragmatic meaning. If a kid, for example, says um, birdie or ball, then parents will know because of the context, and with young kids, because they don't have the full language at their disposal, context is even more important for the interpretation, that the kid, for example, wants the ball, or whether it just wants to draw attention to a ball. Okay? So it's not just um, a kind of truth conditional, um, if a kid says ball, then it classifies X as a ball. It wants the parent to do something. Okay? It's a pragmatic uh, directional device. And let me see, even though it's produced as one element, again, as a specific um, item, um, is also that. And what happens is that kids come, come up first with these specific micro-constructions, want a ball, and then in the next step what they're going to do is they're, schema they're going to schematize one slot, there's going to be uh, verb islands as they are called, um, um, so that once the kid realizes that want a ball is not just one thing, you cannot just only say it for the ball, you can also say want a toy, um, want to eat, want a something, then it generalizes to the next level, to a more schematic construction with slots in this bottom-up kind of way. Should we go through them? How about you? Get a few more minutes? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, and uh, that's an interesting um, experiment by Kassenheiser and Goldberg, which illustrates this. How children can uh, 
arrive at this general mesoconstructional level and what role the microconstructions play. So she investigated a non-English phrasal pattern um, where a noun phrase and another noun phrase and a nonsense verb occurred. So that's, and of course, um, she used a non-English pattern so that she could be sure it's not something the kids had already learned. And it had a novel meaning, and the NP appeared on into NP2. So um, they would be exposed to sentences like, um, the rabbit, the hat, moo pooed, which would mean the rabbit appeared on a hat. And how did they learn it? Um, well, she had 51 uh, children, age range 5 to 7. Um, and the most interesting bit about this is that it's a very short experiment. Okay? There wasn't like a, a lot of input. That's the most fascinating part. There was a three-minute training session where they were exposed to this new construction. And it was eight video clips of puppets like a frog, a bit like Kermit, um, um, performing various actions. I'm not sure whether that's going to work because... The sun, the sky, fagoed. Oh, the frog, the box, mupos. The frog, the box, mupoed. Okay, um, you couldn't see it, but in, for example, the frog, the box, mupoed, they would just see a, a scene of a box, and then the speaker says, the, fo uh, the frog, the box, mupoed. Then you see a doll, a, a doll one of those puppets sort of dropping a frog. And then the voice said again, the frog, the box, mupood. So the kids saw a scene. They weren't instructed what it means, but they were, a, they were supposed to glean the meaning of the construction by instances of it. Now, for the experiment, Goldberg separated them in three groups. There was a control group that just saw the clips and no voiceover. Okay, that's our usual kind of control group. Then you get uh, a balance group, and we will see what this exactly um, looked like. But they had a balanced set of different verbs, mupu, fago, fico, illustrating the same kind of pattern. And just as with the um, be happy, be sad, uh, be still, okay, different instances that could lead to the generalization of the NP1, NP2, verb O construction. And then there was a skewed group, which also had different instances of verbs, different types, as they are called, um, but also one prototype anchor, one verb that was more frequent than the other. So what does this look like? So you see the scene of a rabbit appearing on a hat. And the balanced frequency group would hear verbs like mupu, veiko, sutu, kibu, figu, fairly balanced. So the rabbit, the hat, mupoot, and if... Um, uh, the frog drops onto the box, the frog, the box, vacuud. In the skewed frequency group, you would also get different types, vaco, sutu, kibu, figu, but mupu appeared more often. So the rabbit, the hat, mupu, and the frog, the box, mupu. In both, you get variation, and as we already said, different types, different uh, variants of a constructions are necessary to generalize to the next level, because you will only know that there is a B adjective construction if you've seen different adjectives being used. If it would just be happy, then you would just use be happy. You wouldn't know that you could also use other adjectives in there. But if you hear be happy, be sad, and be silent or whatever, then you know, oh, it's a slot. I can put other stuff in there. And that's the same setup for this experiment. In the new experiment, the, she then tested um, whether kids had learned some kind of abstract construction by putting the two clips side by side. And in one of the scenes, a character appeared in the scene, because that was the basic meaning of the new construction. Some element appears on, in, uh, next to another element. And in clip B, they would always see a, uh, an actor, a, a character performing the action while remaining in constant view. So no appearance, okay? That didn't qualify as an instant of the construction. They heard 12 sentences. Six of these were the usual transitive noun phrase, verb, noun phrase. He is juggling the balls, that kind of thing. The frog is juggling the balls. Um, and then it was, of course, tested, did they get it right? If they saw a transitive scene of um, um, a doll juggling and someone said um, the doll is juggling, they would have to press that one and not the one uh, where something appeared. 
And that's the important point. None of the verbs that she used in the training session, mupu, figu, viku, appeared in the experiment. Okay? She used new novel verbs. And why did she do it? Because she wanted to exclude the fact that the kids had just learned mupu and were able to say, okay, I've got a, a verbal subcategorization frame now, and mupu means something appearing on something, so um, I only generalize these two slots. But by using six novel verbs, for example, nibu, that wasn't in the training set, if kids got that right, they must have got access to an abstract representation to the, of the schema, which means mp1, mp2 appears on something. Okay, and how many novel constructions were correctly identified? And remember, as I said, I mean, there's, this still needs um, um, sort of much more further experimental work, I think, because it's such a fascinating finding. It was a three-minute training session with five to seven-year-old kids. And in the experiment, completely new novel verbs were used, and what you get, you get from the control group what you, what you expect, okay? There are six items that are tested, of the new construction, and if you have never heard it, then you've got a 50-50 chance of getting it right. So the control group out of six got three as a baseline. That's what you get even if you haven't learned anything. Now the balance condition, where you had many different types of verbs, fibu, um, um, mupu, or whatever, uh, in the input, and they heard the construction, they performed better with the novel verbs. Okay. Significantly so. So the error bars here would be lower than that. So significantly they got four out of six, which after three minutes of training is impressive. Okay, they, so they learned something. And they must have already tapped into an abstract construction because none of the verbs had previously appeared. However, best out of, out of them all, the skewed group um, performed. And the skewed group, you had type variation, different types of verbs, but you had one which was used more frequently as an anchor, so to speak. Not one that was used again, so the anchor didn't show up, but it seemed to have facilitated the learning of the construction. Okay? One specific lexical microconstruction plus variation of different types of other types of microconstructions. So, as you can already see, that's a first indication, and, and um, language acquisition studies clearly um, support this. Frequency, input frequency is important. How often you hear something is going to be reflected in how deeply you entrench something in your brain. Um, that's the metaphor of obviously in the ground, you know, the deeper you entrench, the deeper you go in there, and the, the stronger it's going to be. And it's the same thing. You hear a word more often, it's going to be entrenched more often. You hear a specific microconstruction, don't worry, be happy. Okay, that's a full big microconstruction. You've entrenched it because you've heard the song by Bobby McFerrin like a thousand times probably. If you're as old as me, I'm not sure you might be young. But um, you've got different songs. Um, that kind of way, so this can happen. But on top of that, if you get different types, um, um, be happy, be sad, unhappy, untrue, unfriendly, because of the type variation, you generalize to a schema. Okay, so high token frequency, if one type appears very, very often, don't worry, be happy, you entrench this microconstruction, and we talk about high token frequency, many tokens of one type, don't worry, be happy, over and over again. But on top of that, um, okay, so high to token frequency leads to the entrenchment of one specific substantive microconstruction, don't worry, be happy. But variation, high type frequency, many different verbs being used, um, many different adjectives, gives you the entrenchment of a schematic construction. That's how we get the schematic templates, which you can then use to be creative, to fill in new elements. Okay? Because you're not going to lose all of the individual types that you've heard, but the, the, the more abstract mesoconstruction allows you to, give, uh, to produce creative patterns. And ideally, it looks as if what we as humans need is a prototypical anchor, okay? One type that is more frequent than the others, and that helps us to sort of stabilize it, plus variation, plus type frequency that says, oh, I can extend the pattern, but I know what the meaning of the pattern is because I've got a prototype that supports it. If we think about... Don't give it here. Uh, no. Um, if you think about the ditransitive construction, subject, verb, object, object. It's pretty clear that the, um, uh, the most prototypical instance of that Pardon? give, yeah. So give is the most prototypical one. She gave him a letter, and that's going to be highly frequent. 
Did I say something wrong? <laughs> okay. See. See you next week. Um, so. <laughs> Um, you've got this one, you've got many instances, and you've all encountered hundreds of examples of give. Okay? But that would only mean that you've stored give, um, subject gives, um, object, object. Okay? But on top of that, you've got, you know that there are instances like um, um, he Googled him the answer, um, she sent him the letter, he emailed him the presentation. You've got different types, and different types help you to say, oh, it's a pattern. I've got a constructional schema with slots, which I can generalize over the micro-constructions. Um, but give, obviously, as a prototypical verb, helps you to support the meaning of the diatransitive construction um, with respect to the basic meaning, what the verb means, and that there is a transfer um, from subject to object. Okay? And what Goldberg has also shown to a certain degree is um, if you look at adult speech, then the prototypes are not going to be, in many cases, that dominant because you've got many different types um, that also compete with it. But if we look at the input that children get from caretakers, from their mothers, their fathers, um, or whoever looks after the kids, that um, um, caretaker speech, usually, if you look at a specific construction, like the resultative construction or the... Um, um, the, the transitive construction are going to use more of these prototypical ones. Okay? Give is going to make up a higher number of, it's going to have a higher percentage of all diatransitive constructions um, in the speech of parents to children. And later, if, if you're talking adults to adults, the prototype is not going to be as frequent. So it seems as if subconsciously, um, parents also provide these anchors, the prototypical ones, which help kids ideally, like in the experiment, you need variation to, to get the more abstract template, but you also need an anchor, a prototypical one, that helps you sort of stabilize the meaning of this, so that you don't lose track over the individual instances, because every verb's going to mean something different, they mean something different, um, to stabilize the call. So if we look again at what we had earlier, the um, morphological um, um, template, this was what I introduced to you earlier, the morphological correspondence between an adjective and the unadjective construction, where we've got similarities on form and meaning level. From a usage-based perspective, how do we arise? How do these arise? Because you hear unfair, untrue, unreliable, you generalize to the schema, because you've got type variation. But things like unfair and untrue um, are going to be much more frequent and more deeply entrenched and going to act more as anchors than things like um, unwieldy or anything else that you come up with. And in the same way that with adjectives, fair, true, and reliable, um, there we've got a whole range of types which are very, 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 very frequent. Um, but something like this is Gucci and so on, new stuff that comes along, not so deeply entrenched. Okay? You need the variation to extend to the meso level, but you do not lose them, okay? You might forget them if there's one that you never ever hear again, but what we know from passive vocabulary and from the mental knowledge, we store much more, okay? We're able to retain much more um, in a redundant kind of way because once you've got the schema, you could get rid of those. You would be able to produce untrue and unfriendly um, just because of the schema, but you don't lose the specific ones because your mind doesn't work like that. It doesn't forget stuff that it hears very often. It entrenches it more deeply. And for the changing of schemas, um, for the diachrony, and for the uh, synchronic variation, that's going to be very important, the specific micro-constructions that are there and how they interact. Um, this is also sometimes been called an exemplar-based view. Exemplar means that if individual exemplars are stored, um, some people would even say it's only exemplars. Okay? And that what we've got here is also just a linguistic generalization of four meaning relationships, something we've already pointed at at the highest level where we said it's very difficult to say what the form or the meaning of an imperative construction is. Um, so that would just be emergent patterns. Um, but then you would still have to explain the creative uses, okay? that you extend it to a new pattern. If it's just those, you've got to find a way from the exemplars to the creative use. And with the schemas, it's pretty easy to say um, this was so un -Berg's a speech, okay, which you would be able to process despite the fact that you've never heard it before. Okay. How about the coffee construction? 
I was just about to say, we might pick this up after the break and add a couple more bits and bobs, and then I'm going to hand over to Alex, and he's going to lead you back in time to the history of English. Okay? Thank you very much.